okay class. The last bit we'll talk about is the regulation um, of heart rate and how that affects cardiac output. We talked about a ton of other mechanisms that affect um, or influence uh, cardiac output. We talked about the Frank Starling principle. We talked about the venous return. We talked about inotropy and mercalcium sensitivity. We talked about the force uh, frequency or velocity relationship. Um, there's other things that affect it as well, ischemia, acidosis. There are obviously different extrinsic factors like um, certain chemical agents, pharmacological agents, catecholamines. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then there's neural uh, factors, which we'll get into in a bit. We also need to think about heart rate or chronotropy, right? So key thing to remember at rest, um, there is, you know, well, there's both sympathetic and, and parasympathetic regulation of heart rate at rest. It's primarily going to be the, the parasympathetic nervous system kind of pumps the brakes on heart rate. That's accomplished through the vagus nerve. Um, and it innervates the SA node, the AV node, and the atria. The SNS, sympathetic nervous system, reaches the heart rate through the superior, middle, and inferior cardiac accelerator nerves. We cover those in anatomy. Um, basically, sympathetic will increase heart rate, increase contractility. Parasympathetic will just kind of do the opposite. There are also some extrinsic chemical things that can increase heart rate. Catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine, secreted by the adrenal gland, will bind primarily the beta 1 receptors, which increase heart rate. Then, obviously, the barrier reflex, which we'll talk more about next week, which is kind of involved in uh, balancing the, or involved in the autonomic system by disinhibiting the SNS. We'll, we'll talk more about that next, next week. Um, now, there are other factors that can affect heart rate, inspiration, right? We will learn more about that later on in later courses, but we typically find as we in if we increase thoracic volume and decrease pressure as we draw a breath in, we typically see a higher heart rate. We're not sure exactly the mechanism for why that happens. We think it might be an a kind of an advantageous adaptation um, where we you know we're getting more blood drawn in, remembering how the effects of you know pleural pressures and stuff like that on the heart. Um, we're drawing more blood in, right, because we're allowing more flow from the vena cava, but uh, and we'll increase heart rate to get perfusion out. Not exactly sure why that happens, but that's something that we see. And then obviously temperature, right, is higher body temperature, typically see a higher heart rate. And then um, we see, uh, you know, increase in heart rate with uh, atrial stretch um, due to the, the Bainbridge reflex. But it's important to note that too as well. As heart rate increases, it increases demand on the heart. There are other factors that can increase myocardial demand, heart rate, contractility, obviously, wall tension, wall thickness, chamber size. Um, a thicker, thicker wall, thicker chamber size will make it harder for the heart to work. And remember, um, the heart gets its perfusion from itself, right, from, from pumping. It does not get perfusion from the blood remaining in the chambers. Therefore, if we're working harder, right, um, you know, we really need to make sure we're matching supply and hoping that those vessels stay, um, those coronary arteries stay open and unobstructed. Um, so again, myocardial oxygen demand you might see is MVO2 or, um, here, right? It's a, it's a balance, right? And we'll learn more about this in, in cardio palm where there are situations where either the demand increases, right? Because we're, we're beating out of, you know, too fast. Um, or the work so high, like there's super high afterload, or the situations where supply decreases, which could also happen if afterload, if we talked about how stroke volume decreases with a higher afterload, but maybe have an obstruction somewhere in the coronary arteries, right, that affects our ability to perfuse. Um, so uh, the last little bit too, we'll talk about the autonomic nervous system. So all parts, again, of the heart receive sympathetic nervous system innervation, especially the ventricles. The vagus nerve does innervate the SA node and the AV node. Um, it, it, it has very little effect on the, um, the ventricles itself. But again, we know the, the tone is typically set by the, you know, the, what's going on in the AV node uh, and the SA node. So again, autonomic effects. Again, there's chronotropic effects on heart rate. There's dromotropic effects, conduction, and contractility. This makes sense, right? If the SA node, right? Like if we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, like we want to be able to run away from a saber-toothed tiger. So we're going to make the heart beat faster, beat stronger, um, you know, and, and conduct faster as well too. So that makes a lot of sense. And here's just a graph showing kind of what happens with sympathetic simulation, right? So we've got, um, you know, if we at a given right atrial pressure, 
if we've got you know maximal sympathetic stimulation, we see cardiac output you know skyrocket, right? Um, if we see uh, you know parasympathetic stimulation, obviously we see it reduce, right? Um, so again, it's just kind of giving you know an example of how these things work um, and why you know we see higher heart rates during exercise. Sympathetic nervous system is usually favored. We see higher cardiac output, which makes sense because we want to be able to run. You know, from whatever that external threat is. Um, yep. And uh, this again, just showing you know the importance again of the nervous system for controlling cardiac output. Um, there's an experiment here showing that you know if we remove nervous system control, um, which is this kind of dotted line here, and then with nervous system control, um, I think diphenol is is a is a is a pharmacological agent which would reduce arterial pressure, uh, dinotrophenol. Um, if we have a, a healthy, robust nervous system controlling heart rate and blood pressure, um, we see arterial pressures pretty much stay stabilized, even with this, you know, agent introduced. If we remove it, we see, you know, huge reductions. Um, this can get kind of interesting when we work with patients with heart transplants where they lose that nervous system control and they have um, impaired ability to regulate heart rate and blood pressure, especially during exercise. We'll talk more about that later on, but just kind of showing you the importance of nervous system control. And here's a nice little graph um, showing the role on um, the uh, of the parasympathetic and uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system on different aspects of the cardiovascular system. It's really important to note, though, that uh, the, the parasympathetic nervous system has a very, very, very minimal, almost absent role on vascular smooth muscle tone. There is some um, some speculative evidence out there, too, that like it, it will help with dilation by releasing endothelial uh, relaxing factor. Um, but it's 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 not as direct as the role of the sympathetic nervous system, which has like specific receptors. Um, that will, will play a role in alpha, alpha adrenergic, beta adrenergic, and so on and so forth. So it, it's a little bit different, but we'll talk more about that in the vascular um, physiology uh, lecture. So uh, with that, that is cardiac physiology. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in.